too. I'm just I haven't recorded these calls in a while. I'm just going to record this one just for fun because it's such a moment in history. Uh, and this is the Rex call for July 10th, 2024. Um, yeah. Which of the multiple newsy items is topmost in each of your heads, if I may ask? Well, I'm still happy dancing over the fact that the worst government in the history of the UK has finally been kicked out. In and 44 like days, as I may point out. I, I, don't know how, I don't know how you guys do it, but Rishi Sunak calls an election and 44 day, days later, he's moving out of 10 Downing. Yeah. That's impressive. Can I just say? Like, like, like the night he concedes is the night he's packing boxes yeah. and getting out of town because the next morning, Starmer is moving in. I, I don't know how... The Brits are never in my head that fast movers. I guess they just prepare for it. Yeah. Yeah. But congratulations and thank you. Well, it's a start, man. I mean, and it's a it's a bit of good news. And then of course and they the, the French and the French went, followed up on that too. The French and, went and pulled off this extraordinary thing uh where they actually prevented Le Pen from getting into power. Thank God. The French pulled a big reversal um by changing how their candidates appeared basically they withdrew a whole series of candidates and backed one in each yeah. district so that that one would get God. the majority vote yeah That's quite impressive extraordinary example of the left actually collaborating with one another kind of crazy Mika, did that <laughs> blow your head not the way with a feather. <laughs> sorry hello hi what? Mika. did the french did the french reversal of fortunes blow your brains the way it blew mine uh, well, yeah, I mean, we didn't expect it would work so well. Uh, I think everybody was shocked by the results, but uh, I guess they uh, have a longer historical memory than other people. <laughs> I don't know. I like the flexibility in the French system, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just asking everybody what of the many interesting newsy events going on in the world was topmost in each of our brains. Uh, and Mike was uh, Mike was the first to go and he expressed his gratitude for the recent British conquest. Um, and I'm wondering what it, what is in everybody else's head? Mm. Which one? Come on. There's a lot of stuff going on. Hi, Susan. Thanks. See you, see you in the chat. Uh, Kelly, what's top? Wh which of the, the world's news events uh, is lingering topmost in your head? Well, who just said, and was it Mike that just said about, like, it's like the left could collaborate on something for once. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity here domestically that we could maybe figure out because, oh my God, what is happening? So there was, there was a really interesting comment by somebody who actually said, you know what, this actually illustrates that people were hungry for some kind of radical change. And when the left offered it in France, they were able to defeat the right. And they were actually saying uh, Bernie Sanders could have done the same thing with the left in the US. Mm. I don't know. I thought it was an interesting thought that maybe there's a maybe a more radical agenda would actually have taken away some of Trump's base. But on the other hand, it seems like it seems like they're so rabid and and brainwashed. That's the impression I get. Um, I don't know if it will work. Yeah. Jame, what's the top of your brain? Um, so just as a, just as a background, uh, Janice, my wife, it, it doesn't really follow the news. She basically leaves it up to me to, you know, if anything important is happening, I can, I can tell her. Meanwhile, she can, she can worry about her work and she can worry about cats and her various, you know, projects she, work, she works on. doesn't have to deal with the shit. So she has a much more optimistic and positive life than we do. Generally does. But um, 
with everything going on with Biden, and especially when it looked like there was a very good chance he might actually be forced out, uh, which seems less likely now. Um, I said, look, you know, this is last weekend. I said, look, we, I got to let you know what's going on. And so I gave her a little rundown of that. And then we watched the most recent episode of The Boys. Now, I don't know if any of you watched that show on Amazon Prime. It's a superhero parody where, as I saw it described today, the good guys are the bad guys and the bad guys are the good guys. Uh, but in this episode, the, uh, the, the evil Superman character has teamed up with a, um, the, the AOC analog politician who's actually a secret soup, a secret, she can blow up people's heads with her mind, um, TV, uh, to basically take over the government in collaboration with a meeting of the um, Federalist Society, actually called out by name, the Federalist Society, a bunch of billionaires getting together to talk about taking over the country. And there's this long monologue about how democracy isn't real. And it's, you know, it's just basically, it's a, a term that people like. And in reality, the rich people are basically drilling down into something that felt way too real. And Janice got really upset. She's like, this just, it just felt like the visceral version of what we've been talking about and seeing it. And it just felt so horrible yeah. to have that kind of experience or to, to see that being played out like that. Fortunately, there are no evil supermen or head popping uh, Congress people uh, in the real world, we hope. Um, but uh, just thinking about it, I, I get so wrapped up into in thinking about all of these developments as being parts of a scenario, parts of uh, pieces of a forecast that. It really hit me hard to see how this feels for a normal person to to see just how very upsetting all of this is to to someone who doesn't have to be thinking about this all the time and therefore is experiencing it fresh relatively um and and it makes me question am i not taking all of this stuff as seriously as it deserves because i am you're not fictionalizing it, but um, thinking of it in a very structured way that makes it feel more like a narrative than a reality. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this gets me questioning my own my own take on things. I had to stop watching uh, Black Mirror because it just started feeling a little too close to reality, and I was like, yeah. "No, I can't watch it that, at all." That party where everybody's rating each other—that's that's, that's going to happen tomorrow. And I was sort of, I, I could, I had to bag it. I had to shelve it. Um, what's interesting about fiction is that you have free range to amplify, uh, specify and, and make the future as real as you want, right? You can, you can go build something. You can go build the world and the future that, that plays out somehow, even as impossible or plausible as it may seem. Mm -hmm. Um, Mika, which of the many um, firestorms in the world is uh, top of mind for you? Well, I it's funny because I, I spent, uh, I just got home yesterday from an eight-day trip with family uh, to Guatemala, uh, which was, a, we were going with my uh, sister-in-law and her son, uh, who's 17, uh, who was adopted from there. And this was the first time uh, he, uh, they had connected with his birth family or, or parts of his birth family. So we were in a very different mental space. Uh, and, um, I'm sitting here writing my newsletter for this week thinking, well, I, I just spent the last week experiencing the news through a, a, a fairly narrow straw. Uh, it's not like I was, uh, constantly online tracking everything or, you know, the way some people are. Um, but as I think about your question, Jerry, uh, what's so interesting to me about the last 10 days or whatever it was since the debate uh, was this moment that opened up of uh, 
rampant possibility um and and how i noticed both for myself and for other people who i interact with uh a sense of gee this could actually be really good um and uh you know instead of having a nail biter of an election that is the hinge of so much for the next god knows how long um you know it might be exciting um to you know have someone who could really uh defeat trump and not just barely defeat trump um and so it's a bit depressing to see that closing down i don't think it's completely closed though i think we're in a weird you know uh every day now it's like uh some combination of krem krem kremlinology and and trying to figure out if if uh the synod has elected a new pope <laughs> um, yeah we're looking for know? the white smoke um i mean nancy pelosi this morning didn't exactly say i'm with joe you know um and it's yes, Jamey, I agree with you that, you know, if if Biden, he will have more senior moments and it's just a question of um, how uh, damaging, you know, the uh, politicians are very um, attuned to their own survival. Uh, and at the moment in the House, uh, I, I mean, I have a friend who's... Uh, chief of staff um, for a fairly progressive member. Um, and, you know, people are divided, but uh, nothing concentrates their minds like knowing uh, we were supposed to be getting back into the majority and now it looks like we're gonna be in the minority more. Um, so I don't, I don't feel like it's completely over, but uh, it it has been educational uh, to see how you know the the sort of Brezhnev regime keeps itself going, um, and and gets everybody to you know march in line, um, which is what we have to do. If Biden doesn't drop out, we don't have much choice. Uh, we can't do much about it. So it's just been a very uh, hard week, I feel, um, to to see uh, just how creaky this system is. Sclerocracy. I like sclerocracy. It's just hard to say. It, yeah. That's not really right, though, because, it, it. I mean, it's gerontocracy, isn't it? Sclerocracy. It, it is, but I th I'm thinking with the sclerocracy, it's because they're just so stuck and rigid. And unmoving but that sclerocracy yeah. would mean that they that they've got plaque in their veins um and you mean uh parkinocracy or something <laughs> alzheimocracy well, uh, no he doesn't it's not it's, alzheimer's yeah it's not alzheimer's but it's probably parkinson's well yes which is a difficult yeah. diagnosis though my my father-in-law who's 95 um also has many of the same mannerisms his memory isn't great but he it's still there enough uh he has difficulty speaking with force and he definitely also will lapse into the blank stare um so you know we can see where biden is headed what's so frustrating is seeing all of the people who are defending him by saying look at all the stuff he's done and sure all of it it's true he's done yeah. some really great yeah. stuff both as president and over the years but um, past results do not do not guarantee future performance, as they say, especially with age. Yeah. Uh, if I may propose a line of thinking uh, for a second, um, the thing that disturbed me most about the debate wasn't Biden's kind of lapses or whatever else. It was the fact that Biden was completely unaware. He showed up for a debate and actually mustered facts, even if we couldn't really hear him. But if you listen to what he was saying, he was trying to be in a debate and um, Trump showed up for a cage match and very successfully ran over Biden and at, at no chance 
did Biden actually have a reasonable comeback or a way to face Trump? And when Biden's in a friendly audience, and, and I'm friendly, I'll even include press, he's okay. He can make his way through. But but in any kind of face mano a mano combat with Trump, I think I think he's completely incapable of defending himself. He's he's sort of defenseless. And that scared the hell out of me. So um, the age stuff, you could sort of work around. That thing seems to be invisible. Now I'll say something that's much more positive, which is um, in the last two State of the Unions, I saw Biden successfully troll the Republicans during the speech. He said, "You'll certainly you agree with this, you agree with this, but so then you agree with this. And he kind of basically flipped things on the, on the MAGAs and they were caught. They were basically caught having applauded for something, which then they needed to like back up. And I'm like, well, okay, he's got a couple, like he's got a little bit, a couple live rounds still in the clip. And that made me very happy. So assuming that, here's my plan. Um, Biden says to everybody, hey, y'all, let me still be the candidate through the Republican convention. Let me let them dump all their ammo into me. I will absorb all the bullets. They can go crazy on me. They can go. You can, I can hear that song in the background. Um, uh, but but let let them work themselves into a lather and use up everything they got and the platform they'll have for four days in Milwaukee um, on me. Then I, you know, then just before our convention, I will step aside and we can have an open convention. I, I'm completely torn about Kamala, totally torn. On the one hand, a piece of me says, just go for it. Hand it to Kamala, say she's the nominee, and let everybody else step out of the way. And let's, let, let's force, because the right has done such a good job of destroying woke and DEI and equality and inter anything, uh, you know, like they've done such a brilliant job of eviscerating all the movements that I thought were making some progress that, you know what, shove it back in their face and say, this is a chance for us to see how many racists there are in the country. Y'all are racist, vote racist. But if you all want to save the save democracy and keep going, come on in and just really go for it. Um, mm -hmm. But the, uh, plan B is open convention, figure out who it is and stand behind them the way the French have stood behind, uh, you know, uh, one candidate per, uh, per district um, because they had a, a, a parliamentary election, not a presidential election. But anyway, that my, my, that's my most hopeful scenario is that Biden has actually got a strategic thought left in his head because right now he's back footed on everything. The Democrats need to get off the back foot and onto the front foot. They need to, if, if they're constantly reacting and doing only uh, uh, problem fixing, we're doomed. The election is gone and solid in part because everybody will see that the Democrats are only wrong footed and back footed and, and, and can't seem to get uh, like any kind of forward momentum and that's going to doom them. So um, I, I think this is really important. <laughs> I could see that working, although I would, I, I would say that there's no choice but to be all in on on Kamala, uh, simply because um, black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party, and you don't want to directly attack them. That's right. just like the most the, the ludicrously stupid thing that you can do as a Democratic Party. I, I I agree with that, although I'm still completely torn on Kamala. I was I was not a fan of Kamala uh, being the candidate until a couple of conversations recently where I'm like, well, you know, and also unexpectedly, um, who was it? The Wall Street Journal, somebody wrote a, uh, a really glowing piece about Kamala's prospects. I'll find it. I think it's Axios. Uh, they wrote they wrote a very positive piece about Kamala where I was like, well, all right. Although I we will say very turbulent times. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I think uh uh you could you can make the case for the one you just made, Jerry. You can imagine uh, a 25th Amendment case uh even further down the line. A 25th uh, Amendment is, I, is all back footed. That, that's all terribly negative. It is, but I'm just saying it's not like uh it's not out of the question. It just depresses me and we lose that. If if twenty fifth amendment is the way that Biden gets pushed out, I think we're in major crisis mode and things are going down the tubes. Yeah, but if if Biden has a stroke and uh, you know can't speak, 
Um, I mean, you you and I don't have any control over uh, what his aging process is going to be like. Um, yeah. So, by the way, black women are the primary group uh, at the moment backing uh, sticking with Biden. Uh, so, huh, um, you know, they're pretty loyal. Uh, and we're not seeing right. much. So of if, you, yeah. if you go against them by by pulling out of support or pulling support from Biden and then insult them by saying, and we're not going to support the first black woman yeah. VP. Uh, I, I just think it'd be devastating. Right. One thing that occurred to me recently, though, is Trump, uh, something that Trump could have done during the debate that would have absolutely um, nailed the whole thing for him. If he had stopped looked and when it was his turn looked over and said are you okay joe you know even if it was like kind of slimy pseudo pseudo concern if, if trump just had done being, this? i'm sorry if trump had done that if trump had, basically if trump had you know basically looked over and said and really just pointed are you doing okay joe that to some way just really underscoring that even trump noticed how bad Joe was doing, and it, it just it obviously counterfactual, you know, completely different universe. But yeah. it just struck me as like, wow, that would have been really that is a parallel universe. Yeah, it is. I don't. I don't think the debate helped Trump uh, very much. Um, no, it 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 didn't move his numbers up. It's mostly that uh, it just hurt Biden enormously, hurt Biden. Um, and now Trump is just. Uh, I mean. He has a convention. He has to pick a, a vice president, and they have to remind us how terrible they are. Uh, For four days, it's going to be so fun. Oh boy, I know. So I'm looking just forward to this. We were all looking forward to the sentencing, which was supposed to happen, I think, tomorrow, yeah. uh, and that's now been postponed, um, which is too bad. Yep, I had it on my calendar. It got moved out to September. I know. I know. I know. I had it on my calendar. It was like I was going to be like, "Yeah, baby," just before the convention. That's right. Um, Susan, you were uh, wanting to step in. Oh, oh <clears throat> my, <clears throat> sorry, I haven't spoken yet this morning. <laughs> um, so you're probably <clears throat> in the coffee um, pump there. Yes, I'm trying, I'm trying to wake up. I slept completely through the alarm. It had been going for half an hour. <laughs> like, had the pillow over my head and I thought, okay, this is telling me something. Anyway, um, I had a question about Kamala, and I, this may or may not be an appropriate time because it's quite a change of subject, but not really. Um, um, black is she? I'm sorry. What, what's your question? How black does she is she? Does she read as black? To socially, um, socially, yeah. That's basically how she is. <laughs> Because um, seen socially, she's Asian American also, but she's seen as black. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah. There's no question there. Well, certainly, if she were to be, you know, running, <laughs> she would be certainly classed that way. Yeah, I mean, you do run into women who say, "I, I don't think." That a woman can win, uh, and you know there, there's a whole second layer of hesitation that comes up. But you know, ninety percent of a person's voting decision is is made by simple party affiliation, um, and we're really worrying about swing voters in a few places. Hang on, I I have to mute because I'm waiting for a AAA truck to show up at my house. Wow. For... Shoot! All right, Sorry. good luck. I'll be right back. Yeah. Yep. Um, if the Democrats don't get out of defense mode into offense mode, they're screwed. And and I think it, I, I I think the needle's not moving very much because there are some very deeply entrenched people at both ends here, like mm -hmm. who, are, who are just not going to move. And and then there's all these swing voters who who knows what they're deciding, what they're doing. Also, I'm 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 tending to interpret polls. If I were answering a poll these days, I'd be using it as a signal uh, of how I feel and what I want to happen before the election, not of how yeah. I'm going to vote. 
I, I would be trying to scare the Democrats by saying, yeah, hell no, I'm not, I'm not going to vote Democrat. They're idiots. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm unclear how trustworthy polls are at this point. Yeah, no, I don't think tr polls are very trustworthy. Um, I've completely lost what I was about to say. That's why I use the chat to take notes on, on, uh, what I want to say. So I don't have a senior moment. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's what the campaign's about all of a sudden. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Mika, why, when 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 Hillary debated Trump, she should have been training in uh, how to intervene with a bully rather than an actual debate. But she came out and thought she was having an actual debate. And Trump, this is the interesting thing to me. Trump has understood that he can't win an actual debate. He needs to undermine the debate and do something so bad that he will own the news cycle for the next three days. And that's good because he doesn't care if people are yelling at him or not. If it says Trump on the screen and that's it, that's modern power, but not okay. so bad that he'd be kicked off the trail. And what one of the dynamics that, that's active in politics that I simply don't understand, I'm pretty sure I've said it here before, is Howard Dean is off his campaign trail for yelling to exhort his troops in a slightly hoarse voice. And a week later, he's gone, right? I, I, I don't get that. And, and and eight years of Obama and the tan suit is his big, uh, you know, uh, uh, tragedy. Um, and here we are, we're daily. I, I just look at what um, gets posted out to the public from what uh, Trump posts on Truth Social. The things he writes, the, no politician, never mind a presidential candidate, never mind an ex-president should be writing. All of them are horrible, um, but horrible. He has shredded the Overton window. He has made it so that he's still the candidate, despite bite or because he can now say just about freaking anything. And I think that that fact is a big reason for his followers loving him and thinking he has so much power is that he can say freaking he has made elbow room for himself that nobody else has. Sure. He, well, he understands, uh, you know, he, he broke the media system and made it work for him. Uh, yeah. by just providing a spectacle every day and having no shame um and uh you know he's he has successfully barreled over you know any sort of opposition within his own party um so the only way to stop him is is you know with a some kind of popular front a la France or whatever, and um, beat him again at the polls. Uh, but yeah, no, we're 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 you know in deep doo doo, um, and uh, is the I, left I, so scattered I mean, I think that they the can't point come about together? Hillary though? I you know Trump was some I forget whether it was Van Jones or someone else who who pointed out maybe it was uh, Rashad Robinson that that Hillary was a documentary and Trump was an action movie. Um, and you know she was arguing with facts, and he was he was emoting, um, and providing a, a you know I mean and again you got to remember, people most people prior to 2016 thought that he was a successful businessman, um, and they knew him from a TV show, um, where he fired people every week. Uh, so I, you know, his his rise to prominence, it's it's more like Zelensky's rise, uh, a creature of television, um, who again, you know, demonstrated that he was against the elites and against the system. Um, and most people do not have the time, Jerry, to pay attention to details. They don't have a library of books behind them um, where they can go back and check things. It just They've got the inner tubes, but they're using that for TikTok scrolling. and uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, which is why someone like AOC is so successful, because she has a mastery of that medium, too, um, and communicates regularly in great intimate detail with, you know, millions of Instagram followers who she has taken behind the scenes. She's very good at it. So there are ways and... good at good at this for, for good or good at this for bad. Um, and uh, the I was thinking about the problem, you know, Trump was up to his bad old self during that debate too. 
but it's not news. You know, yeah. the definition of news is something new. Right. We're uh, so used to it. We we've now normalized the Trumpian behavior. Um, every day it's more of the same. So why tell people? But something new happened that day, which is the other guy sh sh shat his pants, and woof. Um, we better talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, thank you. Sorry uh, for the image. And, exactly. and any minute a tow truck is going to show up at my house, unfortunately. All right. Uh, I just wanted to say one more thing before, before I'm going to have to go. Um, what's illustrative to me at the moment, you know, I, I wrote a book called The Big Disconnect, and I, I call my substack The Connector. But we, we're missing a connection between um, how you aggregate sort of grassroots public opinion and turn it into political agency right now. Um, in 1968, what pushed Johnson out, uh, you know, he's, it's the only other sitting incumbent Democrat to ever abdicate. Um, and, you know, Ted Kennedy tried to do this to Carter in, in 1980 and he failed, but Eugene McCarthy and then Bobby Kennedy combined along with showing in the New Hampshire primary that, you know, Johnson uh, uh, was vulnerable um, and Johnson didn't have the heart to try and run for reelection after Martin Luther King was killed and the cities blew up and Vietnam was just getting worse and worse. Um, it broke him, but there was a force led by political actors named Eugene McCarthy and, and Bobby Kennedy pushing him. Today, if there's any such force, it's invisible. Um, and we're, we're, it's a democracy deficit that we have, um, that we can't get, you know, or somebody would say it's a collective action problem, right? Uh, that Democrats can't unite around a strategy here. They don't have a vehicle for demonstrating clearly which way we, you know, to go. Um, I'm going to put a, a thing in, in the chat. I mean, the one thing I've seen develop that's trying to be the, the vehicle for that, but you know, the, the barn doors have, you know, the Biden team is working hard to close the doors um, and prevent this from happening. Um, Susan, then me. Um, I had two points and both of them are passed. So we'll, I'll just wait. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me take, um, Mika's argument and stretch it way further. I think, uh, he was talking about the reality TV star. Um, anybody know who gorgeous George was? Jamey, only one Mike, you don't know gorgeous George. Um, so gorgeous George, actually, let me, um, ba -ba -da -ba, ba -ba -da. gorgeous George, um, was a heel in professional wrestling and heels are cowardly villains who everybody loves to hate. Uh, so gorgeous George, uh, there's a, here's a YouTube video I'll post as well to the chat, but gorgeous George would come out with a, with a like blonde curly hair and gold uniforms. He's, he's the wrestler in England who started this whole thing about uh, preening and, and so forth. And people used to hoot and holler and they showed up like he sold out arenas. He was great. So Muhammad Ali was a fan. Muhammad Ali learned about gorgeous George. And when you think about Muhammad, I'm too beautiful. Nobody's going to touch me. Um, that's that's adapted from Gorgeous George, but turned into what what Ali could do, which was he could sort of found rap uh, in some sense. Um, Trump has a really long history in MMA and ring wrestling and and all this kind of stuff. He completely understands this and has become a modern Gorgeous George. He is a heel, and the heel is a character on stage in a cage match. Now the cage match is rigged, just like he's saying everything is rigged. So there's a play within a play here that Trump and his followers understand and nobody on the left understands. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. 
It's it's kayfabe. Political kayfabe, exactly. Uh, and kayfabe uh, for everybody is uh, basically open secrets. Uh, in fact, it's been called neo kayfabe. Yeah. Who did that? Yeah. Oh, there's a really nice, oh gosh, I'm forgetting I even saw this. There's a really nice uh, article from the New York Times uh, by Reisman way back when. When, did, when was this written? Uh, 2023, February 2023. Let me actually just screen share real quick so you can see what I, what I took as notes on it. Uh, so here, the best way to explain the GOP is found in the WWE. Uh, so here's Sports Entertainment, Vince McMahon, Trump, the McMahons, and World Wrestling, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a whole bunch of it. And here's Neo Kayfabe, which goes back to um, Kayfabe. Open secrets, pro wrestling, acting, fake stuff. Yeah, I mean, Trump has been closely aligned with the whole WWE, even back when it was WWF. Um and uh, there are a number of a number of the popular clips of him that often get turned into memes are from his various appearances in, in wrestling shows across the two thousands. Um, you know, he's been in the ring, in character. Yeah. <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Susan? No, I'm not laughing at you. I was just laughing because I just thought, I just thought it was the right response. <laughs> yep. So how about that Supreme Court? Oh. I forgot for a minute to be worried about that. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mike, good to see you. Thanks, Mike. I can't go there. Okay. Now, there was one bright moment, in my view, a bright moment, when, um, uh, yeah, I'm having lots of senior moments, so pardon me, but the woman who, <laughs> the woman who, the new conservative woman, uh, Amy Coney Barrett. Yes, thank you. Um, is uh, I, I, you know she she starting to come out of her shell, and um, I felt mildly, mildly, mildly encouraged by that. I think she has a potential of becoming an extra Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, conservative would... but not crazy. Yeah. We could certainly use a dose of that. That'd be great. I love that. Just, I keep seeing the parallels between Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Bi Joe Biden in oh. terms of oh. being yes. needing yes. to go, yes. Yes. but yes. being so wrapped up oh. in their own legacy and ego. And Diane Feinstein. And Di oh God, Diane Feinstein. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, really. I mean, and there seems to be no mechanism. You know, I mean. In you know, part because one they, of the things that gets were... gets pushed is saying something about it, and you get accused of being an ageist. Yes. I mean, yes. there's an element of that that's just. I, yes, I am. I, mean, I don't know. It's. I mean, you know, what what do I say? You just have to get out of the way. It's painful. I mean, it's painful. 
but it's selfish. It's so very, very selfish. Well, that was I mean, really underscored by what uh, Biden said in the interview about uh, you know if he keeps running and Trump wins, you know what's his reaction? It's like, well, I gave it my best. <gasps> this isn't about you. Well, I know that's the thing is it is about him and and I'm also blaming the family. Um, and you know, Jill was saying, well, we'll you know we'll take care of this. The family will take care of this or something like that. And I go, what about the rest of us? Don't we count? I mean, yeah. Yeah, this isn't Grandpa giving up his car keys. This is a bit bigger than that. No, and I and I wanted to point out. Well, I will come back to the point. One of the points I was going to make here, I can insert it. Um, I uh, um, I don't think. I mean, I was uh, dabbling with um, in my family affairs. Well, I wasn't dabbling in the affairs. I was talking to a couple of cousins and um, and I have one cousin who, you know, still thinks and I'm, I, I don't want to make one example be, you know, the truth, but I mean, be what's going on. But it's don't forget that a lot of people still think that he was a good businessman. Yeah. And that he has the backing of big money. And he does have big money backing him, but he doesn't have the backing of all of them. And and people just don't have that. There is a, a lovely piece, um, which I will hunt up and put in the in the uh, in the chat. That took that really the guy who somebody who was on The Apprentice. Did anybody see this? Okay, so The Apprentice, there's a guy who was actually a big part of The Apprentice and had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that only recently um, expired. And so he's come forward on various parts and he has a very lucid piece on what it was like, A, to work for him and B, uh, you know, and, and to see what, what was really going on behind the scenes, which we all know, except it was a very lucid, you know, thorough piece. Uh, help me out, somebody. Uh, hang on, I can find it. He was one of the producers. He was one of the producers. Well, he wasn't. Yeah, one okay. of the yeah I did see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, you just sort of I've want just, to. Spend I've that. just put it in the chat. I just thought, thought I wanted to. Uh, oh yeah. Where? Yeah. It's the Slate article. It's uh, Bill Pruitt. Yes, exactly so. Yeah. I don't see it in the chat. Come on. Oh, wait. Anyway, it's there. Yeah. So um, I just feel like that would be a, a handy thing to hand out. But, you know, we were having um, a uh, discussion at the 4th of July meet. Uh, 4th of July, we had a, a small gathering. Um, and there were two, um, a couple things of, of note, as you know, my, my, my neighborhood is, uh, small and, and, um, kind of, uh, idiosyncratic and everybody has to be, you have to be clear, you know, declared idiosyncratic and possibly crazy to join. So, um, Uh, somebody want, was suggesting that we uh, give one of our favorite former Democrats, you know, a copy of this and um, a copy of this article. And I thought, well, except that he can't read. And so <laughs> at least with some of us have decided that. Uh, and so that's this kind of stuff just doesn't go out you know and um and it's mostly discouraging to read yeah so i don't know the other thing was about it was that this meeting was uh, a sad comment i'm sorry mika's not here at the moment but um because it, because of this there used to be a, a gentleman here in the community who hosted folk dances on memorial day and labor day 
And lots and lots of people came to that, and lots and lots of Israelis came uh, to that. And two, fam two groups of them have moved in to the community in the last couple of years. And uh, it was this 4th of July was hosted by um, a couple, and, um, he, and he had just been to uh, he had just been to Israel for three weeks, seeing family and friends. And he came back and he said, well, you know, I used to think that if I, when I came to the U.S. and I got citizenship, I thought, well, if things don't work out here, I can always go home. And he said, now there's no home to go to. He said, everybody I know is moving their money out. Everybody I know who's in the technical field is, you know, looking for jobs elsewhere. Um, and it's just collapsing. Uh, and I don't know, I was hoping for Mika to give a little more insight on that, but um, it, that was also sobering. Um, and on that theme a little bit, um, as you know, I have two, two Russians who, who are living in my big house and she's to, he's applied for citizenship um, a couple of years ago and got it. And she's applying and she's thinking she's going to get citizenship in July. And I'm not sure how to, uh, I mean, maybe I don't have to do anything. I think there should be a cake and some firecrackers. I mean, some sparklers or something, but I can't, I feel so embarrassed about our country. It's very hard because she was so, you know, in her thirties and so, so loved our constitution. <laughs> and loved what all of the things that we stood for, which, you know, and I don't want to disillusion her. I'm, I'm sure she's disillusioned. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's an odd little community we have here. That it is. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for joining. No, oh, thank you. Had to do some medical stuff for Heidi, so... Glad to be here. We've just been through the whole Biden debacle and a bunch of other things. Um, we could go elsewhere. We have a few minutes left. How about that AI I stuff? Sorry, go ahead, Susan. I, I was just going to say <laughs> silence is okay. We can sit in silence. So on the OGM calls that I host on Thursdays, uh, we alternate formats and every other week we do a check-in format. And for various and sundry reasons, that's turned into sort of a Quaker meeting kind of, yeah. where there's long pauses between the check-ins and mm -hmm. we're just like appreciating the pauses. And uh... mm -hmm. We're knee deep in the AI stuff over in my neck of the woods because Apparently, this is the this is the next thing that people think you can just turn on, mm -hmm. and it will fix all our problems, which is hilarious to mm -hmm. us that have yeah, grown up the change, <laughs> or tried to make any single institutional change about anything ever. So, yeah. this did I, you see the AI chat bot that the Washington Post put together about climate change? Will no. not answer any questions about AIs using too much power. Oh, amazing. I've seen some I, do, really I do not use too much power. <laughs> do use too much power. Turn your air conditioning down. I need to answer questions. <laughs> yeah, you know, I step up while I do it. Yeah, and I mean, how this is one of those, Kelly, this is clearly one of those both ends that you got to get the optimist to be more pessimistic and the pessimist to be more optimistic, right? Um, because, you know, the truth is, yeah, it's, it, it all depends on what your intention is, Yeah. right? It all comes down to intentionality in terms of how you train it, how you use it. And that's what I'm trying to get people to understand, right, about about AI and doing workshops that says, yeah, don't run in and try to apply it to everything. You you should be much more selective and think about how is this going to help you because it could ruin things as much as it helps. And it wasn't trained on your data. 
right? So it doesn't understand the world the way that you understand it, right? Amen. There's also, uh, there was an article also in the um, New York Times recently about, um, well, it was about the, uh, well, a bit of history. So in linguistics, we were all, in, well, some of us weren't, enamored of Chomsky and his, his way of looking at the world. And um, I often said to people, I said, I don't understand how you can think that he is so great socially when in fact he's just not been good for linguistics because it's the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, that's my own personal um, view. And the Yes, he's still alive. Yes, I, I know. I know. I'm sorry. But <laughs> we're recording this, but it's not news. Um, so I, uh, there was a, there was a piece in the, uh, maybe it was by David Brooks. Is it David Brooks? No, it wasn't either. It couldn't have been. It was somebody else. Anyway, um, I should start taking notes. <laughs> um, it was a, a claim about, um, you know, the claim that, Oh, Chomsky is supposed to have said at some point, one knows, doesn't know whether these things are now apocryphal or not, but that, um, you know, language can't be, you know, its purpose can't be communication. And of course, it, you know, and then this debate goes on into whether or not people are, whether or not people are, uh, Boy, I am out of practice. Um, you know, people think that uh, that's either funny or, or not true, but the people who've gone on to do MRI research have done, finally have done some very good work that show, shows how we don't need language for thinking and how we don't need language and that it doesn't ma and and yeah so that you know different areas of the brains get to, you know they they give them things to do with logic or math or things like that. and they can do them right without without the language part so it they're very carefully constructed experiments and i thought well at the end the the article called, called suggested that you know the chat gpt things one of the reasons that you know it seems so artificial sometimes and so off is because some of those things just don't need you know it can't do that kind of work without language right and so there's this big gap emerging <laughs> there which um i as a linguist um and for, have for many years have seen and thought the well, language is, uh, it's very useful. It is for communicating and it's, it's, it's actually good that it's efficient and we have words that can mean many things because if we had to remember all the words, then we would not be in very good shape and so on and so forth. You can see where that goes. But I just thought it was an interesting comment about chat GPTs, those, those things, uh, the big language models that they base so much on, on uh, linguistic form and 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 actually that's maybe not what all this is about um and it may not be helping us think better and uh it certainly can be wrong so um i'll just leave that thought yeah. on the table i don't i haven't followed up on the research to feel confident enough um to say, oh, yes, this seems completely sound. But certainly from my own experience and my understanding of how language works and how we use it, <laughs> it's right on. And uh, it's another thing that uh, people should keep in mind. I'll tell you, I, I jump back in for a second. Experiment that we have, have done over in our collab mm -hmm. is Content Evolution Collab has created you know, over 20 GPT profiles using the open AI system so you can put them in a store right yeah. and we fine-tune them so that there's a 
you know, there's an interview that we do that takes about 45 minutes, right? And you answer you know, typologies of questions. And it turns out that they're re remarkably, do, they do sound like us, right? They, you know, they respond in ways that you would expect, right? But they're actually kind of stupid. They don't know anything because it's not connected to a knowledge graph, right? It says, well, that sounds just like Kevin, but what he's spewing garbage. So now we're trying to, you know, create the JSON files that'll map to, you know, the way that we sound authentic over into this other space. What is is more remarkable is in this experiment is that we have combined them. Every time we get them, we recombine them into a surface so that we write together, right? right? Collective intelligence mode. And uh on any given topic, I'll say, now, tell me who are the subjects that should be quoted, right, when you generate this, and it's, it, you know, puts in the pull quotes, right, right in, inside of it. So it's pretty interesting, and we're putting those articles up every week, uh, because we read them, and we vet them before we, you know, let them loose on the world, um, you know, to make sure that it's actually representing our point of view, as opposed to whatever it's pulling from, you know, what it was trained on initially. So fine tuning has to meet the knowledge graph and we're exploring that territory right now. That seems to me to be uh, more, you know, uh, you know, moving toward the authentic, right, space, but it won't be anything near, you know, thinking that it's human until it has the entire sensory apparatus that we have Right. And these are not disconnected. Oh, look, it can drive a car. Look, it can write a paper. Look, it has to be able to sense the world the way that we sense the world. And then it will be a better approximation, but it will never be human. So, you know, don't look It's we're developing a different typology of intelligence. And can it be a good companion? Yeah, it probably can be, but it could also be, you know, a good adversary. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think it, it'll have to be embodied intelligence before we start to think that it's, you know, it's a good companion, you know, tech. That's my current view. Mm, I, I don't know. Um, in, in speaking purely in terms of companion and companionship, mm -hmm. humans are really eager to, to um, pack bond with pretty much everything. I mean, I'm thinking about those story, you know, the stories from decades ago about the soldiers in Iraq who were got really affectionate towards their bomb uh, bomb disposal remote robots, and mm -hmm. when one of them got damaged, they would want that one back fixed and back because that was theirs, that mm -hmm. was their, you know, their friend essentially, and just you know how how pe weird people get about their cars sometimes and how we've expanded our circle of empathy to, to our pets, you know, and think of them as our family. And yeah, so I, I think companionship, a very strong thing. I, companionship, I think is you know, entirely plausible, even with this generation of, you know, spicy autocorrect version of, of AI. Um, and certainly, even you know, as it becomes more uh, superficially self-aware, uh, you know, it it it, it plays it play self-aware on TV. Uh, it doesn't actually have to be. Um, it, it becomes really easy to be, in many ways, to be a uh, for that fill that companionship role. So the companionship side, I'm not too, you know pessimistic about the functionality and usefulness in usefulness in novel situations. That's where I think these systems are going to not be very useful for a while, but that's my amateur yeah, I, I opinion. I think if, if you follow, you know, what we've observed with social media is that if these, you know, companions are you know, essentially designed to be addictive, right? Then, you know, we're headed down the wrong road with, you know, with, with the typology of, of, you know, companionship that could be useful, 
right? Because if it just wants all of your attention, uh, that's a, you know, that's not even good with a human companion. You know, that's, that's, a, that, that's not a person that you'd want to be spending time with. Oof, you got to run. Bye. Anyway, that's my... Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're training it on human information. We say, oh, look, it hallucinates. Oh, look, humans lie. Okay, C congratulations. Okay, it's actually mimicking our behavior in, in a way that <laughs> you're saying is a, yeah. is a problem. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we should have been expecting this. F f physician, heal thyself, you know? Well, I think that there is this really interesting tendency, and I don't know how much, how much longer it's going to persist. But there's been a, there's a tendency among uh, certainly in in Western culture to see the um, computers as, as authorities. So you know there was an experiment done a few years back um, about a you know somewhere some Midwest college where they basically had a tour robot around a facility, and in the middle of the tour there was a fire alarm that goes off and the tour robot you know, it says fire alarm let me lead you to an exit and in doing so they pass by several obvious exits that are right there could get you out of the building and pe most people continue to follow the robot even when there was an obvious exit right there that they could they could use um and there was just this this idea the argument is that humans still have a perception that robots or AIs have authoritative knowledge and that you know, somehow the, this robot knew what it was doing. Yeah. And, and I suspect that is where the, you know, a lot of the controversy around hallucination comes from is we expect the robot, the AI, to be telling us the truth. I, I can tell you that with a 30 year career at IBM, I was completely disabused of the notion that, you know, the a, that the computer was the authority. Oh. <laughs> too, had too much intimate detail with the people who knew, you know, how this stuff works to in any way imbue it with that, um, you know. But then what you're describing is exactly why people continue to follow GPS, even though they're getting other signals, right, that, hey, that there's a shorter route or there's, you know, something. At uh, one time I got, um, you know, kept on getting pulled over in DC into a different thing because it had um, somehow inadvertently I had checked the do not take a toll road, all right? And yes. so I kept on pulling me <laughs> off on these dirt roads. And I'm kind of like, what in the hell is going on? All right. I said, I'm not going to do this. All right? I know. I was driving that way for a while. And then I realized that I had two of them going at once in the car. <laughs> and uh, finally, I said, I, I did finally pull off. But, you know, it was crazy. Yeah, Just you're getting two, di two different instructions for how to go? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, and I don't know how I it did that. To check but I was the, like... <laughs> Yeah. Somehow, you know, the do not kill the humans box got unchecked. Okay, what in the hell's going on? All right. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well. And I bet the person who added the do not kill the humans option is really proud of himself. Yes. Right. I mean. Right. Because like everything else, it should be opt in, you know. Yeah. Um, no, no. Like everything. <laughs> well, that should be opt in. Everything <laughs> else gets to be opt out. Yeah, yes. I know. I know. No, they the kill the human boxes opt out. Yeah, it's, it's all right. It's 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 Schrodinger's AI. <laughs> you know, is it alive or is it dead? Don't look at it. It'll change. Okay. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I I was only able to spend a slice of time. Susan, Jean-May, do you guys need anything? From my just love. Okay, well, you got, I mean, positive energy, love, all right, you have that. And Susan, at the end of your story, I hope that your uh, people that are living with you um, and end up with, with a good experience, all right? I, I hope that, uh, the, that uh, our, our country, I have a, 
even though there's a lot of doom and gloom right now, I have a sense that um, the system is somewhat self-corrective, even with corrosive, you know, kinds of elements. Always. Uh, it. And I, is I, I happen to be optimistic about, you know, regardless of, you know, who is currently running the, you know, the, the place that um, there are countermeasures that, you know, you know, force it back on course. So I don't know why I, you know, uh, you know accept <laughs> that, but I think that, you know, I, I kind of believe that at an earth level too, that, you know, if we're you know sufficiently uh, bad to the earth, the earth will get rid of us. So um, yeah, I it's am- best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When we're talking politics or or, or environment, uh, I am a miserableist, not a doomer. Oh, yeah, I, that's a great line. Yeah, uh, yeah I, it's, we're not doomed. But it's just going to be pretty miserable. Yes. And so the same thing with with politics. You know, if Trump wins, it's going to be miserable, but it's not going to be doom. You know. Yeah. Well, so, it won't be. I mean, miserable, it said it's it's doom long awful. enough, it'll be doom. But it's you know. That's, it won't necessarily be the Jean Valjean, Le Miserable end, right? <laughs> um, that we have to take our lives, right, to, you know, you know to end the play, right? I have every reason to think that, you know, there are, as long as we can continue to have communities like this and have resilient conversations, then, you know, there's hope. Yeah. All right. I don't believe we're in hope. Back. Yeah, and, and I believe in that, and I wish both of you all the best. We'll talk again. Cheers. Yes, we will. Well, Susan, I hope you. It's lovely to see you again, and uh, I hope that everything goes well. Yeah, well, it's going well enough, as long as I ignore it. Well, you know, well enough is sometimes all you need. That's right. That's true. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Okay. Bye bye. Be good. Bye.